multicast is the topic today. We have seen, you have seen with Stefan last week that multicast works by the principle that destinations have to say that they want to receive, so they have to subscribe. And then routers, local routers like R1, R4, are informed that destinations are subscribing. What remains to see is how the network is able to distribute multi. That's the purpose of what is called a routing protocol, which is the topic of the rest of today as well. And uh, uh, we have started seeing one specific routing protocol called PIM-SM. So there are many, many different methods for creating distribution trees for multicast. The most widespread one is called PIM, Protocol Independent Multicast. Protocol Independent alludes to the fact that it reuses the routing information that is already available in routers. We will see that such information comes in local in enterprise network comes from OSPF most of the time. Yeah, globally at the scale of the internet, it comes from a combination of OSPF and BGP, and there are zillions of other routing protocols. And what this says is that this is independent of such a routing protocol. It comes as an addition. Let me explain PIM sparse mode in the very simple case where we use source-specific multicast. Source-specific multicast means the identity of a multicast group is the combination of an IP address of the source and the multicast address itself, which implicitly means there can be only one sender into this multicast group, which is a typical case for TV and radio distribution, for example. Then in such a case, it's very simple because the job is essentially for routers R1 and R3 or know that they have to receive uh, the data, they have to deliver it. But the problem is for R2 and R5 to know where to send it. In this simple case, it's fairly obvious because the topology of the network doesn't give a lot of freedom, but uh, R5 and R2 need to know whether they have to send it, for example, on this link or on that link or both. The way this is done with PIM sparse mode is simply to use what is called reverse path forwarding. Because there is already routing tables that are assumed to be working, obtained by a routing protocol, uh, we know how to route to S. And since we use it for source-specific multicasts, the identity of the multicast group contains the IP address of the source. So what will simply be done is whenever R1 detects I have to be member of the distribution tree for this group because somebody has subscribed on my local area network, Therefore, I trigger an activity by sending PIM SM message upstream towards S by uh, simply going in the destination by my routing table towards S. Now, it is not a ping message or a message of any kind that would be sent to S. It is a PIM sparse mode message, which is a routing protocol message. Routing protocol messages are sent from router to router. They are not sent from host to host. So this is sent to a router, and to which router? Well, to whatever router is the next stop to go to S, which is R2 here. So R2 will now receive a message from R1, a PMSN message saying, somebody wants to receive SM. Therefore, you R2, you should also receive SM. Then R2 will do the same thing. R2 will, well, first will remember that R1 needs to get it, so it will write its state information that says, for this group, I need to duplicate the packets on the link that goes to R1. Presumably, it will receive similar things from R4. So R2 will know that for this group, it needs to really duplicate so the packets in the sense, send them on two links to R1 and R4 and keep that in this red box, which is the state information that corresponds to this multicast group. Then R2 also needs to now be receiving actually uh, the, the packets. So it will do the same thing. It will send a packet towards S, therefore to R5, saying PIM small, small message, I need to receive the data of SM. And then R5 will know somebody who is R2 needs to receive it, will remember and keep that information. This is how the tree is built. Now how the tree evolves, if anything changes, for example, if those stop receiving, 
is by having periodic refreshes. So once in a while, this will be restarted here. And all the information that is gathered in R2 and R5 times out. So if R1 and R2 stop sending once in a while, like once every 15 minutes, I need to join, I need to be a member of the delivery tree for this group. If they don't do it anymore, then R2 will time out the information and will stop uh, being on this tree. This is the very simple principle of PIM sparse mode. It's a bit more complicated when we have any source multicast. I'll let you discover that. So this is the state of affair for, for example, some uh, distribution networks like uh, Swisscom TV that use, or and very until very recently, was using that type of uh, operation. Now there's a drawback in multicast. Multicast routing requires all intermediate routers to keep per flow state. Remember here, uh, R2 needs to know for all the multicast groups that it is distributing, what is the state? And the state is uh, what are the next pops that need to be uh, dupli receive duplicate packets. This is okay for edge routers. An edge router is a router that serves uh, end customers because an edge router typically has a few thousands of customers. It's limited by the number of physical cable that can connect to it. But for backbone routers, that can quickly become a problem. If you have a very large network, continent size, uh, the Swiss, Switzerland is not a big country, but if you have larger countries like France, uh, then a backbone router may have hundreds of thousands of flows. And then for every flow, you need to go through the real-time operation. It's not so much the difficulty of the PIM sparse mode routing protocol. It is the problem of having to handle the state information in real time for every packet, which needs to go through an exact list of all the groups. And if there are many, many groups, then there are many, many entries in the table. This is the problem. And the problem has been addressed by an alternative method to multicast routing, which is called BEER. So BEER stands for Bit Index Explicit Replication. The idea is very simple. The idea is that, well, it's very simple, but at the same time, it breaks the beauty and the unifying principles that, are the, that I've described before. Because here it assumes that a BR router, a router that manages multicast in this way, will send the packets not to the final destination, but to the BR routers that are at the boundary of the network and of the customers. Let me explain on an example. That's the simplest to explain. So here, I'm assuming again, I have three end users that are subscribing to a given multicast group. So they need to receive this information. Perhaps that's you and me on TV. And you have your network here that needs to forward this. And as we said, the problem is really at the backbone routers. How's the problem solved? Well, we first make a special treatment of packets at the boundary routers. The boundary routers, the edge routers, when they receive a packet that has IP destination, which is a multicast type, they do something special. They don't do uh, the, the forwarding that we said before. They, they start a whole process that consists in obtaining the list of edge routers in the same domain. So this works inside the domain. All the multicast routing protocols that I've discussed work only inside the domain. In fact, multicast today is developed only inside the domain, inside EPFL, inside Swisscom, but it doesn't go, for example, from EPFL to Swisscom or from Swisscom to Sunrise. So in the goal here will be to obtain the list of routers that are in the domain and that need to receive the packet so that we transform the semantic of multicast, which is distribute to whoever listens to the group into something that gives a special role to routers that are at the edge of the network. And we say, we have to send the packets to only those routers here. And that's from a scalability viewpoint that changes yeah. everything because you can have hundreds of thousands of flows but you don't have hundreds of thousands of edge routers. In fact, most flows are the same. So you might have lots of people who listen to a number of flows here, 
uh, but uh, the they are served by a small number of edge routers here. So we change instead of sending to M, we send to R1, R3, R4. So the first thing that this router must do whenever it sees for the first time a packet with destination M is to obtain this. How can we obtain this? Well, that's with PIM sparse mode, it's the goal of the routing protocol. With PIM sparse mode, we've seen that it was the working of the reverse path forwarding that gave that information to all routers. Here, we depart radically from that and we use some centralized information system. We assume here that for beer, there must be a centralized in information system that says who is listening to that, which means that, so what is the centralized information system? Typically it can be SDN, software defined networking. That's a topic we will discuss next week. So those are control servers that can control the operation of your routers. Or it can be some specific software that is running on a data center for the management of the uh, IPTV, for example, or of the multicast application. So as you see, it's no longer a beautiful layer three operation. We go via uh, uh, centralized systems that have a global view of everything. For example, when A joins the group by saying, I want to receive M, then the router R1 will not run a routing protocol to get this. It will have a connection via SDN or via the multicast flow overlay saying somebody on, my, on me, on my router, is listening to SM, which is something uh, that seems to be a bit awkward. But in fact, that's something that we do for other reasons, essentially for security reasons and for management of the network. As we will discuss in a few more minutes, uh, multicast and security needs to be some care. So here we have something that uh, can also be used to control whether it's legitimate to have somebody here that's joining this multicast group, or if we are receiving all of a sudden a huge number of multicast subscriptions, uh, we might have a, uh, an intelligent server here that will try to guess whether this is uh, okay or not. Same thing on the, on the sender side here. If S is sending a packet, then we go here and we can check, of course, who needs to receive one routers 134. But at the same time, we can verify whether it is expected that server S is sending to such a multicast address, which will uh, be a necessary uh, filtering mechanism you need because you don't want anybody to send to your packet multicast packet to your network multicast packets that would make attacks easy. So in some sense, this overlay system is deployed whenever you do multicast just for monitoring that things that are running in your multicast network are not uh, suspicious. So that's replacing what we can call the control plane part of it. Now for the, in real time, what, we'll, what we will do is the following. Once this R5 has received the list of destination routers, one, three, four, then it's very simple. R5 will add an extension header, which is very easy to do if we use IPv6. We've seen that in IPv6, we have a field called next header. So we can simply add a next header that will be giving the explicit list of routers that the packet needs to be sent. Now R7 receives a packet that has a next header, which is of this type, which is a beer header. It means the job of R7 is now easier. We don't look at the destination multicast address. Instead, we, instead, we look at the beer header and the beer header is saying send to one three four what r7 will do well r7 has the information on how to send to one three four from standard ip routing unicast ip routing we will see that there's a way to optimize this to avoid going through ip routing uh, table so the information will be cached and the resulting of this cache information that we will explain in a second is that R7 now knows that it has to send to those two, to those three routers. In order to send to those three routers, it needs to duplicate the packet, send two copies of the packet, one that will reach router one, 
n1, I would reach router 3, 4. So it will create an outgoing packet that with a modified beer header that contains only one destination one in this case, and here only a group of destination three, four. R8 will not modify the routing header, will send it to R4. Now R4 will receive it as a beer packet. Now it will know that somebody is listening on this port, so it will send the packet as a standard multicast packet without beer header. But it also knows that it's not alone. It's also destined to router three. So we'll send it with a beer header to router three. So router three will receive it and remove the beer header and forward it to the local area network, to the switch network that needs the packet. That's the principle. So as you see, it's not very complicated. In fact, the only smart idea is to say, instead of sending a packet to 1 million users, I know I have to send it to three routers. So at the first time I hit my backbone, my specialized infrastructure, I put the information, send it to those three routers, which now will make the jobs of R6, R7, and R8 considerably simpler. They only need to manipulate those beer headers and not the multicast addresses. The job can even be further simplified. So how can those intermediate beer routers simplify? Well, let's look in, in practice to what they need to do. So when a router a beer header receives uh, a beer router receives a packet with a beer header, the key information is a destination set. So there is a set S, which is a set of beer routers that it needs to send the packet to. So what will it do? Well, it needs to find out where to send it next and how to manipulate to modify the beer header. So that can be done by using this algorithm that is sent here. You look at the destination head, the, desti the beer destination list here. You look at the first destination that's in the list. So here, number one. And then you need, you will use what is called a forwarding bit mask, S1, and take the intersection of the set, let's say in the packet header, 134, with this S1, and that will give you the set of packets that you should put in the beer header. So what does it mean? Well, it means S1 is in fact expressing the set of destinations that we reach if we send a packet on this port. So we are router R7. R7 will construct this table here that says, if I send a packet towards one, which is what I'm doing here, in fact, I need to send it to R6. I go that because I, I, I know this information from my forwarding table. And then by screening uh, all the next hops that I have in the destination, uh, in all possible destinations, I see that if I send a packet to R6, for free, I'm also sending it to R2 because R2 has also next hop R6, which I obtained from this table here. So by a little algorithm that's running in the background, I can scroll this table and know that whenever I send a packet to R1, I send it to next hop R6, and for free, I can also send it to R2. Instead of screening this table for every packet I receive, I do that in a, as a background process, and I write the result here in what is called the forwarding bit mask. Of course, for destination two, it's the same. For destination three, if I have a packet to send to three, then we see that we send it for free to three and four. And if I send it to five, I send it only to five. So that information, which is in some sense a cache of the information we would have by analyzing this table, is used here. That gives you the S1. If I send a packet to router one, I modify the destination header by taking the intersection of S and S1. Now, I need to know whether I'm done. Here, in this case, I'm not done because I need to send not just to one, but also to three and four. So how do I know what I need to do next? Well, I take the set difference from all the sets that I need to send to and the set that I have automatically reached. In that case, I do the set difference one, three, four, difference one, two, which means I remove from one, three, four, all the ones that are in one, two, or I do the intersection of one, three, four, and the complement of one, two, and I obtain three, four. So three, four is the remaining set, the destination I have not reached. 
by this first action. If this is empty, that's the end of the story. This is what happens, for example, at R6 or R8. They have only one packet to send. For R7, it's not end of the story. It's not empty. So I do it again. I do the same thing again. I analyze three, four. The first destination is three. I go to the line of three. I know that the bit forwarding mask is three, four. So I send a packet to next stop R8 with forwarding mask three, four. This is how beer forwarding works. Now the presentation I've given is theoretical, academic. It is using the language of set theory, which is not convenient for real-time operation. So what is done in reality is that we describe sets with bit streams. So instead of describing the set one, three, four, we describe it with a bit string that has as many bits as the total number of routers in the beer domain, which can be large. There are optimizations to break it into sub-bit strings if the domain is very large. So I don't describe this in detail. So here we have a domain with five beer routers that are the edge beer routers. That's the only ones that we need to send to. So I need five bits. So the bit string, the, the bit, the beer header contains bit strings of five bits here. And now I express the set one, three, four by putting bits equal to one in position one, three, and four, starting from the right. So three, four gives this bit string and destination one gives that bit string. And then why do we do that? Well, because we have seen that the two operations we need to do is give the intersection of two sets or the, comp the set difference. Intersection is achieved with bit strings by simply bitwise end which is a C operation that you can do uh, very fast. And the set difference is the, is the intersection of a set and its complement. So the complement is obtained by taking the, inversing the forwarding bit masks. That's also an operation, that's the not operation on bits. And so you do the bitwise end and the bitwise end, and that gives you the, uh, the modified beer header. So if you do a Y sharp, of beer headers, you will see such things, such bit strings, which might be a bit difficult to understand, except if you remember that they are description of sets. Well, that's the kind of operations that is done by uh, beer. Um, as we see, it works in a single beer domain and it requires an out of band mechanism. The bit forwarding table needs to be processed in real time and this is at the expense of having an additional header, but this is something that we will see uh, very often in uh, private domains like data centers, TV distribution networks. Yeah. So we've been from IP host to IP routers or multicast. Then at the end, there are switches that will develop deep, uh, deep or local area networks using Wi-Fi. So, one remaining question is how do we map IP address to MAC multicast addresses? So how do we do multicast ARP in some sense? Well, the answer is there is no multicast ARP. The goal of ARP in the unicast case is to find what is the MAC address of whomever I'm sending the packet to, which is the final destination if it's on link with me or the next hop router. For multicast, uh, we don't do this. Uh, for obvious reasons. I mean, ARP relies largely on broadcasts, so you, it's not a good idea to do that uh, for multicast. Instead, there is a procedural rule, essentially, let me explain it for IPv6, where essentially you take the last 32 bits of an IPv6 uh, multicast address and you add it to the prefix called 3333. Remember that the MAC multicast address is 48 bits, here I'm writing them in blocks of two hexadecimal digits, which is the standard notation for uh, I MAC addresses. So we simply take the, re, the, the low end 32 bits, the terminating 32 bits of the IPv6 multicast address, and we put it into the MAC multicast address. And then we have a MAC packet that is multicast here. For IPv4, uh, we do the same thing, except we take the 23 
uh, low n bit. So y23, that's very weird. Uh, the, I don't know if it's true, but the anecdote says uh, I initially it should be 24, but when this was done, uh, the guys who did it had to buy this prefix from IEEE, and it costs some money. So they bought it for, I mean, MAC addresses are the half, first half of a MAC address is allocated to a company. Apple, for example, has lots of blocks because they create devices that need MAC addresses. Cisco, uh, et cetera. Anybody who does hardware needs a block. EPFL has a few blocks here for a number of uh, past research projects. So whoever did that when this was being standardized had a block and they said, but we need it already. So we keep one bit for our standard use and we give you the remaining. Uh, so if the first bit is one, this is used for us. If the first bit is zero here in this block of 24, it's used for IPv4 multicast which means we have only 23 bits. So this is, and for some reason it has stayed. So for example, if we send an IP multicast packet to this address, we translate it into exa, which gives this hexadecimal address here. Then the low order 24 bits correspond to this six remaining hexadecimal digits. So this block of six here, and we need to modify the first bit of this hexadecimal digit, which will transform an eight into a zero. And that will give the transform thing here the, with 23 bits that we include in this prefix. So this is the MAC address that will be automatically done by the MAC hardware or the uh, rather the IP, the, the operating system when it creates a packet here. In particular, the consequence is that several multicast addresses may correspond to the same multicast MAC address. Several multicast IP addresses are confused into the same MAC address. But this we've seen already with IPv6 when we use solicited node multicast address. We've seen that we create a packet that sends to only a group identified by the low order 32 bits. So there might be a confusion, which means that receiving uh, operating system may need to discard packets. Uh, so if somebody subscribes to this group, they will receive the packets. The hardware will receive the packets that has this MAC destination address, but there might be other groups that correspond to the same MAC destination address, particularly if this eight uh, corresponds to another, uh, if the first bit is, is, uh, is different here. And it will be up to the uh, operating system to uh, delete the packets. How does a switch network handle multicasts? How does a router network handle multicasts? Well, we have seen for routers, we need several things to happen. We need the host to that receive to subscribe. So the routers know if, the route, if there's only one router, the routers knows how uh, to distribute the packets. For example, if this would be a router and if B and C listen, then it would know by the subscription messages that the, those two ports need to distribute the multicast. At the MAC layer, in principle, we cannot do that because the IP layer multicasts are not seen by the, uh, by the switches. So this is what will happen if we have what is called a non-smart switch, that's the switch you can buy for 32 francs on MediaMarkt or Migro to interconnect uh, devices together. It will not uh, know this, and it will simply treat multicast frames as broadcast. So if you are watching something, uh, an iTunes movie uh, on your local area network at home, uh, then the printer will receive them. Right? So they will uh, be discarded, of course, by the uh, Ethernet adapter of your printer, but they will receive them. Now you can be smarter, and the so-called smart switch is violating the layer in principle, and they try to infer who is listening. For example, if your switch is uh, smart, it will simply listen to all the IGMP or MLD, those are the subscription messages for IPv4 and IPv6, and will keep a cache of uh, who is listening to them. That's all the way easier in the sense that very often your smart switch can be configured both as a router or as a, as a bridge. For example, if this is your ADSL modem, 
Typically, it's up to you to configure it as a router or as a bridge, and it has all the software to do the router. So it has all the software to receive those things, and it will receive it and listen to it. It will not trigger anything specific in the sense there is no routing protocol for multicast that is actioned, but it will remember in this case that those two are listening. This one is not, so it will forward only to those two parts here. I mentioned several times that multicast and security uh, security is an issue for multicast because we, of course, make the attacks much more powerful. If you want to do a denial of service attack and you can use multicast, then it's way easier because by on the attacker side, you need much few, uh, a smaller amount of resources to create a huge amount of traffic. Because with multicast, it is the routers that duplicate the packets. This is mitigating by having multicast run only inside a network and having also exhaustive filtering and monitoring, monitoring tools to check and validate in particular the sources. So if you try to send on your uh, Swisscom network multicast packets, for example, they will be intercepted by the first uh, filtering router that will decide, no, you are not a valid source of TV distribution on this network. So that is uh, how it is mitigating here. And, uh, and the, uh, whether we use beer or IP multicast routing does not really change very much uh, the problem, except beer in some sense mandates that there is an overlay that tells you whom you should send the packets to. So the overlay is of course typically combined with the filtering routers to know who is allowed to send. So beer is in fact developed because we assume that we work in this way, whereas native IP multicast could, could work without any filtering, but probably would not work very long in the sense that your network is probably going to die under denial of service of attacks very quickly. The subscription protocol is not secure. It's not authenticated. This is why bridging can overhear it. So that's why also we don't necessarily want to authenticate or encrypt it. Uh, but uh, so it has all the same problems. If you do that on an open infrastructure like a hotspot, and if you allow multicast on the hotspot, then anybody could uh, pretend to be a member. And then that could be a problem here. So this is mitigated by the same principles. Uh, again, having filtering routers and monitoring infrastructures that will observe everything and try to infer whether what you see is correct or not. Multicast in practice is deployed whenever we have a stress on sources, because that's after all the only benefit of multicast is that multicast is good for sources. When we have end destinations, uh, we send only one packet at the source. Of course, somebody multiplies the packets, but we have the divide and conquer mechanism. If we have 10 packet, 10 hops that each multiply a packet only once, that means every router has only two packets to send. At the end, we've multiplied a packet by a factor of 1000. So this uh, exponential uh, increase of the number of, of duplicates means that the complexity is small, even for uh, duplicating routers. The complexity is in having state information. This is mitigated by having beer. But the complexity of duplicating uh, is smaller than the complexity at the source here. Uh, multicast is not, as I mentioned, is not supported globally in the network, but is uh, supported typically in internet TV distributions. Also in data centers, uh, in data centers, you have information that you may want to send to a group of machines, all the machines that are belonging, for example, to a search on set of virtual machines, because the data centers tend to be sliced. You may uh, have machines or slices of virtual machines inside physical machines that belong to a certain group. So uh, when you want to update software, for example, you want to send into all machines that have a virtual host that is running for what, whoever customer, then the simplest way to do that is to have such a virtual host subscribe to a multicast group that will let them receive all uh, such configuration information. 
similar reasons uh, make it very popular in uh, industrial networks. In industrial networks, you have typically low-end devices. So the sources are, for example, sensors. They send packets to a predefined address. And you don't want to modify your sensor whenever you change the set of destinations. Because typically, you do a lot of monitoring in such environments. So you may want to have the intended destination of the sensor, which is your control application. Already, the control application can have multiple processes that need each a copy of the, of the packet. And you also typically have a monitoring application. You have the control and surveillance and monitoring. So you may want to watch and take a record of everything that has happened. And you don't want to bother the sensor in uh, changing its list of destination. Uh, and you don't want the sensor to send to multiple destinations. Very often, you cannot. You buy hardware that's a sensor. The only thing you can do is program its destination address. And you can do that with multicast. So that's very uh, frequent in industrial networks. Uh, it works at EPFL because we use, I think the only use we have is Lab 3, where you will uh, have to work with a multicast server. Now, something to be aware of is that, of course, TCP does not work with multicast. We've discussed that. It doesn't work with multicast because TCP has a zoo of acknowledgments. We've seen, you've seen last week with Stefan, that TCP has very complicated things of things it does, and it does that for every sender, and every receiver needs to do that. So the semantics, the very semantics of TCP is very hard to be made work, to make the work on multicast. The concept of an acknowledgement means I have received the data. So if you have an, a source, a TCP source that is sending to a group of end destinations, what do you do? Do you require all of the end destinations to send you an acknowledgement? Uh, probably not. So all those applications that work with multicast must have some other mechanisms to work with errors and packet losses. For example, for video, we have mechanisms called forward error corrections. Now, the video stream contains redundancy that allows you to repair the loss of a few isolated packets. So if you lose a few packets, you will, there are several mechanisms. A simple mechanism is to interpolate at the destination. You know that a packet is missing. You store the packets in a, in a buffer. So you don't play them immediately. So when the time comes to serve a packet and you see it's missing, then you can, for example, simply repeat the previous packet freeze the image for one frame. Since you do that 25 times per second, that will be acceptable. So that's the low end type of uh, forward error correction. Uh, there are better things that are done in more modern uh, coding systems where you send low resolution information spread into multiple packets so that if one packet is lost, you have the low resolution part of the missing information that's in another packet, and then you can replace it. So those are the state of the art. Uh, codex who use such things. And if you have isolated losses, you see nothing. Uh, so this is how you can replace TCP uh, with UDP. If you want to distribute really binary information where every bit is information and interpolating the missing bits, because this is video by uh, things that will perceptually not look very different, is not acceptable if, for example, you're distributing software. If you're distributing software, every bit, uh, hopefully, uh, should be correct. So this is done not with TCP, but other protocols that we will not discuss, but that could be an interesting uh, research project. Uh, here we use what is called coding instead of simply repetition. When TCP or the stop and go protocol sees that the packet is missing, it repeats it, send it again. That's in coding language, this is a repetition code. I send the same information again and again. Now, perhaps some of you know of, that there are smarter ways to do it. There are, for example, things like read Solomon codes, which are the easier to understand. Fountain codes, we do the same, but are smarter in the sense of the decoding performance. Well, the idea is if I have a block of 200 packets, if I'm sending 200 packets, I can create 10 parity packets, but are able to replace any of the 200 packets. That's the principle of read Solomon codes. So this is what is done by such protocols over UDP when they need to distribute it over multicast. If you have a block to send a software that fits in 100 packets, you send the 100 packets, and then you keep sending parities, 10 more, 20 more, such, 
until you receive feedback from everyone that they've received everything. So if any of the packets has been missed somewhere on the path, any of the parities can fix any of the losses. This is how TCP is replaced uh, by uh, when we need to have reliable delivery. Voila, let's conclude this part on multipath by a few quizzes. So the first question is, who needs to do what? Uh, do you see the poll on your machine, on your device? Yes, I see some answers coming up. I close the poll in a few seconds. And the majority says F, which is the correct answer. So this very specific and funny thing of IP multicast is that for sending, you don't need to do anything. You just send to a multicast address, which in hindsight is perhaps not such a good idea. It would have been better if before sending, you need somehow to register with the network who will verify whether it's legitimate that you can send. So the network will do this anyhow. The, in practice, if you do it, uh, except at EPFL for the lab where we've opened the network to, to receive all kinds of multicast. And so at EPFL, security is by observation inside the, the, the internal network. So if somebody starts a big multicast traffic, uh, we will know who where it comes from. And the lab director will receive in a few minutes later, an email saying, we've seen a lot of traffic uh, multicast coming that. Is that OK? Is, uh, are you aware of this? So this is how it will work at TPFL. On larger networks, it won't work. So the, there will be the, the first router that you're sending to needs to be uh, accepting your multicast. So it needs to be, uh, you need to have a source address that will accept it. But that's how the protocol works. It's only the destination who needs to join. Now, R is an ingress edge router. Ingress means it's on the incoming side of the multicast. So it's we're, we're seeing multicast flows that join R uh, from the outside of, net, of the network here. I'm closing in a few seconds. Closing. And the majority, as you can see, says A, but that's not correct. In fact, it's A and B, which means C. I would love to be able to say, yeah, it's A. So certainly for we've seen that the standard multicast, if we use uh, PIM SM, then we need to keep state information everywhere. Uh, beer tries to get rid of this, but not at the edge, because the edge router receives a packet that has no beer header. It has MAC destination, uh, multicast destination address. It needs to map this to the beer header that it will use. So, and so it will need to uh, keep state information in order to do this for every flow that it does. So what is beer is simplifying is not the job of the edge routers, but only of the core routers, which is what we can see here. OK, so it's time to do a break. So we stop here. 
I will post the solutions of the quiz that we didn't do in class, and we resume in 15 minutes. Two weeks ago was the evaluation, the uh, first evaluation of courses. So here are the results of evaluation for this course. They are, uh, they are good. Uh, there are also some comments. Uh, there is not so many comments, but one comment is on the audio. So I increased the volume a bit today. I hope if this is too loud, <laughs> please let me know. Uh, there was one comment on the lab quiz questions being unclear. Uh, so for that, we're always, uh, of course, we're always working every year and improving them. Uh, and as you know, we try to be very responsive on Moodle. So if there's anything unclear, uh, you should be able to get an answer in a small number of hours by posting this on Moodle. Um, so we have three assistants étudiants who are working all week to, to, to give you answers on Moodle. So don't hesitate to ask them. Uh, and if you're not happy, then you can ask Stefan or me. There was also one comment on the lecture quiz saying, well, I do the quiz and I, it's not so, I, if I get the wrong answer, I don't understand why. So could you give more help? Uh, in theory, yes. Uh, for next edition, perhaps we'll try to do this. Um, it's possible, of course, in Moodle to have a lot. Yeah. Moodle has infinite complexity. You can do, you can do everything you want to help you when uh, when you do something wrong to give you hints on why it is wrong and etc. So we'll, we'll we'll review whether there are some parts where this is necessary. But let me repeat also the goal of the lecture quiz is not to. Of course, it's part of the teaching, but it's supposed to come after the lecture. So you're supposed to first attend the lecture or watch it on. On, your, on, on YouTube, and only after that do the quiz. If you immediately try to do the quiz, of course, you might find it's not so helpful. So the quiz are to be worked jointly with the lecture. Well, and if there is any other feedback or anything, you're happy, we're here happy to hear, but also if you're unhappy, we're happy to modify and take corrective actions. The topic now is uh, OSPF link state routing. And this figure is illustrating, if you omit this part here, which I'll leave aside, uh, this is showing, this is illustrating exactly what link state routing is. This is a view of the topology database. So this is a diagrammatic representation of the information that in uh, OSPF is called the link state database which explains the fact that with such method of link state routing, all nodes in the network have a complete view of the entire network. But before diving into this, uh, let's talk of routing in general. Uh, I should mention also, so this, this lecture here will be on OSPF, and OSPF is the second generation of routing protocol. And uh, people are so happy about it that they some made a song. So I encourage you to uh, go to this one. I'm not guilty at all, not responsible at all for this song, but it's fun and I like it. We've discussed routing protocols already. The goal of a routing protocol is to do what we can call the control plane of the IP layer, as opposed to the data plane. The data plane is the functions that are essentially in hardware that have to forward a packet and possibly change the header. For example, in the IP header, we need to change one thing when we go and we're a router, which thing? The hop limit, exactly. Hop limit or TTL needs to be uh, changed at every. So that's part of the data plane to do that. And you have to do it in real time. And the control plane is about populating the values of what is in the IP forwarding table, which is also most often called the routing table. And the job of the control plane is taken care of by what is called a routing protocol. So the word routing is overloaded with many meanings. Routing is similar to IP forwarding, but it's also uh, similar to the distributed or not so distributed protocol that will calculate all the values that are in the IP forwarding table or in the routing table. So a routing protocol 
is a means to automatically compute the routing tables in a network, in all routers in a network, or in all the routers that participate in the routing protocol. In the internet today, there are essentially two routing protocols that are deployed. Uh, one is uh, OSPF. Well, there are many uh, in practice, uh, there are many and it changes all the time, but the dominant one is OSPF. Uh, the dominant ones are OSPF. Sorry, OSPF is the dominant one for what is called interior routing protocol. Interior means inside the domain. The domain is, for example, EPFL or Swisscom or at &T or IBM or part of IBM for very large uh, companies. So that's something that is under the control of a single administration. Between domains, we use BGP. And now there is, so inside domains, there are many different protocols and the dominant ones use the OSPF, the one we will start exploring today. Between domains, there's only one, that's BGP. And that will be the purpose of a special lecture when we will talk only about BGP. OSPF is the, belongs to what is called the family of link state routing protocols. As I explained on the figure of my first slide, it is based on the idea that all routers in a domain first learn a map of the entire domain. This is obtained by gossiping. Gossiping means flooding all the information where every router knows a little fraction of the map. It knows what are the directly connected networks and uh, it knows also its neighbor routers. So that's, it has a local information, then it sends it to everybody, floods it to the network. And after receiving all the information flooded by everybody, uh, all routers have a map. We'll talk more about this in a few more minutes. Then we assume also for this and all interior routing methods to work, that we must be able to allocate a cost to every connection between routers or from any router to any network here. This is often done by default, for example, by having a cost that is a, a non -de uh, uh, decreasing function of the capability of the link. So high speed links have a smaller cost than uh, uh, low speed links. Many routers protocols come with default. So once you know what is the type of interface, you automatically allocate a cost to it. But typically it is part of the network design to allocate the costs with a very simple design rule is that the cost, the links that you want to be in the backbone, then you will give them low uh, cost. The links that you want to be uh, not in the backbone, you will give them higher costs because the routing method here, it consists in computing the shortest path to a destination. Shortest path where shorter means relative to the cost that you've given to the links here. BGP does not use this method. We'll discuss that again. In BGP, there is no cost because giving costs requires that you have a unified administration. You agree on what a cost means. Uh, in BGP, which is external, which is between uh, entities that are not managed by the same administration, it's too complicated to do, to do that. Though with BGP, we'll see that we do different things. And BGP uses what is called explicit paths to all destinations. Instead of uh, link state will compute a cost or destina uh, uh, a distance to a given destination, which is a single number, BGP will not do that. In instead, BGP will compute an entire path. We'll discuss that and when we discuss BGP in detail. But to give you a preview of this, a path is, for example, the sequence of all the networks that we go through. For example, if we go from here to a network in California, we might go through EPFL, then switch, then perhaps uh, AT&T, then perhaps uh, US Sprint, then perhaps uh, IBM. So the path is the collection of domains that we go through. But there are also many different routing methods that are not dominant, that were dominant in the case of distance vector. Distance vector was the first routing method that was deployed with the internet. And there are other methods that are developed, that are deployed in specific contexts. So RIP is an example of what is called distance vector. That's a method that has been uh, popular 20 years ago, has been superseded by OSPF, but is still present when you have small networks. And because it's very simple, 
And with RIP, the idea is that every router in one domain simply uses as a routing information base its routing table. Routing information base means the information that the routing protocol keeps to do its job. The OSPF, or link state routing, uses a topology database. It uses a view of the entire network. That's part of its routing information base. Uh, RIP, in its very simplest form, does not use this. It just uses the routing table. Because it is based on the fact that every router updates its routing table by receiving the routing tables of the neighbors. Or more specifically, every router first informs its neighbors of its estimated distances to all destinations it knows of. At the beginning, it's a very small set. It's all the networks you're directly connected to. And this table is called the vector of all distances, hence the name, distance vector. And then it works by simply passing the information to neighbors, and the neighbors will update their information using what is called the Bellman fold algorithm. I will illustrate that in a minute. And this is magical. This message passing method converges to correct distances. We will not see this in detail, but I will illustrate it in an example. So if we use RIP on a small network of four, net of four nodes, this is a very small network, a ring. And there are network prefixes that are shown here. D is connected to prefix M3. So that's a subnet. Uh, M1 and C is connected to M1 and M2. And the uh, links between routers are themselves uh, subnetworks. So that's our very simple network. When the networks boot, then they know that by configuration, a network like D, for example, must know that on the north interface, it has the uh, subnet N4. On the south interface, it has the subnet M3. And on the east interface, it has the subnet, uh, uh, sorry, an M3 and N3 on the east interface here. So the, this is the original information that we have. And we can configure in RIP a distance from self to a network that by default would be one here. So same thing for those four networks. And the principle of RIP is, this is my routing table in some sense. I know that uh, if I need to send to N1, the next stop is A, which means it's me, so I send directly here. Then I pass my, net, my information to my neighbors. So with RIP, the networks, will, the routers, will discover that they are running RIP by sending a hello type of, pack of message. They're saying, hey, here I am, I'm using RIP. So A will do that. So B will know that A is using RIP. And this hello message will in fact contain the entire routing table here. So B will receive from A this information that A is connected to N1 and N4. Similarly, C will receive from D the information that it is connected to N3, N4, N3. This is not a topology database, it's just the local information and the cost of going there. Then the Bellman Ford computation consists in saying that C will use this to improve what it knows. What does C know? Well, what C is booted, it knows only the local, the directly attached network. It knows those four networks. Now, when it receives from D, for it has new information. For N3, for example, it knows D is distance one of N3, but I am already distance one of N3, so we'll compare this to what I have. Is it better? How can I compare? Well, I calculate what is the cost of me going to D, which is one, and D going to N3, which is one also, that would be two, that's less good, I discard it. So this is no new information. For N4, it is new, because I did not know of N4 before, so my distance to N4 was infinite, not being in the list means the distance is infinite. Then I know my distance of going for D is one because I go via N3 that has a cost of one. So my new distance to N4 is one plus one, two. And that's the best I have, so I keep it here. Same, M3, I discover M3 here. So we see that by passing the routing, the routing table to the neighbors, we help the neighbors discover new prefixes that exist in this network and calculate their distances. Here we have discovered the neighbors that are two hops away from us. We know the neighbors that are directly attached and C has learned by receiving one message networks that were one hop away. And then this will continue. P 
periodically C passes this information to all of its neighbors. So C will pass it to D, and it will pass it to B, for example. C will pass all this information to B. Now B will indirectly know about M3, for example, because B will discover from C that C is at the distance two of M3. Since B is at the distance one of C, B will compute, oh, I am now at a distance uh, three of M3 here, and the next hop is C. C will receive similar information from other nodes, and at the end, they will uh, it will converge. That's what the theory of the Bellman four algorithm says, that this message passing methods, if the network is stable, uh, in fact, what we do is in one, one round, we increase the depth of discovery of the network. We first discover the directly attached networks, then the networks that are two hops away, then three hops, then k hops away. And at each time, we compute the best possible distance, and that converges. And at the end, we have a routing table that is uh, discovered by everyone. This is how RIP works. Of course, there are many bells and whistles to discuss. What happens if you change something, if the network uh, changes? For example, if you decide that M3 is no longer at a distance of one, but at a distance of two, you change the cost. What happens to this? What happens if a link breaks? If the link between A and B breaks, and then B, of course, uh, the, the routing table is invalid. Sooner or later, A will resend a message to B, but not to B, but A will send to D, that sends to D, that sends to C. So B will discover a new distance from C. And the question is whether that works, whether this uh, Bellman for computation will correct the will compute the correct distances, and the answer is yes. And this was the beauty of the very first routing protocols in the internet. RIP has a number though of, of issues, in particular, if the distance becomes infinite, for example, if you break at the same time the lines N1 and N3, which you can say that's not possible, you don't have uh, joint failures, you cannot break two things at the same time. But yes, you can, for example, if they are in the same plastic conduit, if you can have two lines that go through a tunnel, for example, and there's a fire in the tunnel and the two lines are burned together. There was a historical case in the uh, in Boston City, the airport, the tunnel between the airport and the city burnt, and all the cables that were in the in the tunnel broke, and you had uh, the network of at and was disconnected, for example, because of exactly this. So what happens if these two things are broken together more mundanely, in a more mundane way, in a city like Lausanne, where the roads are being opened every two, three years, you can easily break cables, and uh, it's possible that there is construction in Renan and in Lausanne, and that the two cables are broken. That can also happen. If that happens, well, this message passing system will compute the correct destination, except the correct destination is infinite now. The distance from B to M3 is infinite. So this message passing will compute infinity, will compute uh, plus infinity, which means it will uh, take an infinite time to get to the right values, which is not practical. That's the major issue with this method. If, the, if there are disconnections, it's very hard to detect them because there are mechanisms to detect them, but they're heavyweight and may take a long time. This is why uh, most uh, uh, private networks move to OSP. But there is another method that is also worth uh, discussing. It's called source routing. The concept of source routing means that it is the route, the source that computes the route. And the source puts the route into the packet header. In fact, it's a bit what beer does for multicast. Beer edge routers, they compute a source route that they put into the packet header so that the rest of the backbone uh, can just follow this route. Now you can do this at uh, for unicast routing also. There are two variants of it, strict source routing and loose source routing. Strict source routing consists in having the source compute a, a path to the destination and put it in the header. We can put it as an extension header, but if we want to be smart, in fact, what we do is the following. Assume the route computed by the source is A, R1, R2, R4, B. So this is the route here. 
then A will put the next hop as destination and the rest as, of the route as a routing header. So that the job of A now is sent to R1. And the job of A was to compute the route, which is complicated, but the job of the intermediate points is very simple because now R1 has a stupid job to do. It has received a packet with routing header R2, R4B. The destination was R1, so R1 knows it has to do something with this packet. Then it simply takes the first element of the routing header, puts it in destination, and send it to this one. This is how source routing works. Where is it used? It was used in the past in some bridging methods, but that's obsolete now. Now it's used in what is called ad hoc network. An ad hoc network is a network you deploy uh, because there has been a catastrophe, for example. You've lost the network because the Russians have destroyed it or because there has been a flood or uh, an earthquake. And then you deploy uh, devices that can be routers or even hosts. You can have your PC configured as a router. And there are protocols like DSR, uh, that is a routing protocol for such cases, where essentially the routers will try to establish to see whom they can reach via Wi-Fi, direct Wi-Fi, and then establish um, router adjacencies with whoever is, uh, is around. And then they leave the job, and then their routing job will be very simple. They don't need to run OSPF or whatever. And now how will the route be discovered at the source, and one method consists in doing what is called explorer packets. So the source will send uh, explorer packet that is broadcast. It will try to reach B by sending, hey, I want to reach B. So we'll send it to both of its neighbors, R1 and R2, who will do the same, except now this explorer packet will accumulate the path taken by the packet. So when R2 receives a packet from A saying, hey, I'm trying to reach B, R2 will see that the accumulated path is A, therefore it will not send it back towards A, but it will send it again to R1. R1 will receive a packet that has accumulated path A, R2, R1, so it will not send it to R A, it will not send it to R2 again, it will send it only to R3. So of course doing that is not very efficient in terms of the resources you use, but it's very simple in terms of the software uh, that is to be run in the devices here. And if the network is fully connected, one and probably a large number of packets will reach B, and then B will apply a rule, perhaps use the first one. That's uh, perhaps not so bad heuristic because that means that was the packet that was fastest to come to me. So that's the one who took the fastest path. So B will receive an Explorer packet with a path accumulating in it, which is perhaps this one, and then B will reverse the path and send a reply to A. So we'll, B now knows how to reach A, and now A knows how to reach B. That's a use of ad hoc routing protocol uh, with source routing. We call this strict source routing because the path is a sequence of all intermediate hops. The next hop is written in the, in the path. There's another form of routing that is used now more often in, for example, data centers or uh, enterprise networks that is called loose source routing. With loose source routing, the idea here is that we want to force the packet to go through some intermediate steps. For example, here, we want to force all packets that go from A to B to go via R4, R2, and R5. How do I go to R4? Well, I use OSPF to go there. Why do I want to do this? Well, presumably because I want to do something special that is available only at R4. So I want to make sure that the packets that go from here to there must automatically always go to R4. For example, because at R4, there's a firewall that perhaps does header inspection, perhaps even deep packet inspection to authorize what you want to do. So this is what countries like uh, China Net are deploying here. And one way to force you to go via there is either to put, uh, is either to put uh, filtering routers everywhere or at the edge of the network to force the edge routers to insert such a loose source routing header to make sure packets will go uh, through these filtering routers. You can go even beyond. Instead of giving in the packet header an instruction of where to go, which is loose source routing, well, of the via hops, 
You can even give more instructions, for example, which functions should be applied to this packet. Uh, should it be uh, screened by a deep packet inspection or just examined at the level of the IP header? This is called segment routing. Segment routing is uh, an idea of where we give more information than just the next stop, but inside the next stop, what instru what uh, uh, function should be applied to the packet. So this is used in data centers and also for uh, screening functions in, in networks that do some screening. Voila, that was a very short overview of everything to, you need to know about all routing protocols that we will not see in detail, which are OSPF and BGP. So now let's move on to uh, OSPF. I mentioned, as usual, everything is I'm saying is true only as a first approximation. So you need to hear the complete story before deciding uh, about the truth of one of the assertions I'm making. I said that OSPF is using link stage routing, but it's true only within an area. So OSPF uses multiple areas that we will discuss next week. So inside an area, uh, OSPF uses what we call link state routing. So the principle of link state routing is to first learn the entire map of the network. So for this, every router starts with its local information. So it has a routing information base that's called the interface database that describes all its physically connected uh, network. That can be learned by automatic configuration protocol or that in the lab we will manually put into, into the system. And then it also learns who are the neighboring OSPF routers that it needs to speak to. For this, it uses what is called a hello protocol. The hello protocol is uh, simply ping messages, type of sort of ping messages where an OSPF router every few seconds sends a message to all its links saying, here I am, are you still here? And monitors the reception of such messages from neighboring routers. If one such message is not received after three times, for example, we decide that the neighboring router is dead. We do as if it is dead, which is probably the case. When two routers become new neighbors through the hello protocol, that's one of the side effects of the hello protocol. When a router boots, typically routers don't boot all at the same time. So typically there's one network, one router that had been around, has been working with OSPF. Then a new router comes up, then it will say hello. And the first thing to be done is to copy the database that exists in the first router that, has, uh, that was working into the one that is new, that is called a synchronization. In some extreme cases, there could be even two routers that were not connected and are now connected. So they both have information that is valid, that was valid before the new connection. Then they will merge this information. In general, this is called the synchronization. Now the synchronization is easy because the topology database is just a concatenation of all the information we have. It is just a list of links saying router R1 is connected to prefix N1 and a few characteristics of N1, it's gigabit ethernet or terabit ethernet and so on. It's just a descriptive uh, list of information. So synchronizing simply means uh, concatenating everything we have. Once a network a router is synchronized, it will periodically send what is called link state advertisement. So link state advertisement is describing its local information. So it is saying and repeatedly saying what it has locally. And then this is flooded. This is flooded to the entire area, installed by all routers. And this is the gossiping protocol that I mentioned. This is the mechanism by which all routers will discover all the link state information of all routers, which will constitute the complete description of the network. Of course, when you flood, you need to be careful. Uh, if you flood a message, uh, you want to uh, avoid loops. So uh, the sequence number prevents loops. And uh, the age, or we'll discuss about the age a bit later. Let's just see on an example how this could work. So here is a toy example where I have one, two, three, four, five routers uh, switched uh, links, which are which are drawn here with this diagram that shows 
an old style ethernet, a bus that you're connected to. Remember that this is how, even today, this is how the internet is. IP views the world as a connection of local area networks. And the local area network can either be a point-to-point -point link, those are this thing here, I pull an ethernet cable or a or long distance link between A and B, or uh, for example, A and C can be connected because they are connected to the same ethernet switch or well, via Wi-Fi as well. So viewed from the link state routing topology database, we make the distinction between point-to-point -point links and what we call multi-point links. Multi-point, because if I'm connecting to a switch, A can be connected to C, but we could be connected to more than two here. We will see that the third router will come up in a few seconds. So in this network, at the beginning, everybody has its interface database. For example, B knows that it is connected to an Ethernet port that has a prefix N3. And uh, it is called a stub. I'll say in a second what this is. B also knows that it's connected by N2 to a point-to-point -point link. And it is configured with a cost of 100. So we must configure here, as I said, by this can be done by def using default values. Otherwise, you can configure the values here. A stub network means it's a network on which we don't run OSPF because it's a network on which we don't expect other routers to be sitting. It's the end of the world for OSPF. Finisterre is the end, of the, end, end of, the, of the world, which means that from the computation of shortest path, we don't need to bother here because every this is done to simplify the computation of shortest path. Everything that is a stub needs to go via B. Everything that's a stub on B needs to be reached via B. So when we will compute shortest path to destinations, we will not compute the shortest path to N3, but only to B. Here I'm showing only one, but an edge router typically has hundreds to thousands of uh, stub networks. So that dramatically reduces uh, the cost of computation. Here, A is connected also to an Ethernet on, uh, on this port, on the south port, with uh, a cost of 10, for example. And this is not a stub here, because A expects to run OSPF on this uh, network. B will flood its information using what is called an LSA, link state advertisement. That means B will send exactly this information. It's a copy of the topology database. Don't confuse with uh, RIP. With RIP, we saw that RIP sends its routing table. Here, there is no routing table. A still does, B still doesn't know how to route. It's just saying to the entire network, I am connected to N3, N2, and N4, and the uh, other information. Via the Hello protocol, also, B will learn that on N2, it can speak to A. So it will put this information. N2 is a point-to-point -point link that allows me to speak to A. So this information is sent to C. C will gratefully receive it, acknowledge it. The messages are sent using UDP, stop and go protocol. It will uh, be expects to receive an acknowledgement from C. If the acknowledgement is not received, B will send it again until C receives it. Now C has received it it will update its topology database. Now C knows this local snapshot, the view of the network seen from B, and will pass the information. The same unchanged message will be sent to D and to A. In fact, it will be sent, it will be broadcast on the, uh, it will send to all OSPF routers on this uh, ethernet. Similarly, D will send it to E. Now, D will not send it back to C because uh, it will know it's coming from C. And uh, similarly, uh, A will not send it to C because A has already received the message from C. And from the sequence number of the link state update, it knows this link state update I already have. Whenever B will change its mind and send a new link state update, it will put a new sequence number. If the message is lost and resent, it is still the same sequence number same leak state update sequence number. But A has received it already from C, therefore it will 
uh, not uh, send it again. At the end of this, all routers will have this information here. The same topology database called Insta database, or soft, also sometimes called topology database, will be now available in the five routers. So the five routers have the same view of the network. That's the unique thing that's very special with link state routing. All routers in an area, in the case of SPF, at the end of this flooding mechanism, have the map of the network. A bit like if you use Google Map, if you want to go from A to B, computer path with Google Map, you first download the entire map and you do a shortest path computation on the entire map. And this is the form that the link state database has. Now there is something special here. You see for B, there's nothing special. B says that it's local information. No, it's not B says, I mean, the information that is everywhere about B is this here. About C, for example, you see C is saying, I am connected to N4, N5, and N1. And N1 here, there is this field called designated router C. A is also connected to N1, but A is saying, I am connected to N1 and designated router C. Designated router is, in some sense, taking care of the fact that here it's a point-to-point -point link. There's only two, but in a second we'll add a third one. So it could be a multi-point link. And since OSPF uses graph theory, in graph theory we have only point-to-point -point link. An edge is between two nodes. You don't have an edge in a graph that connects three nodes, for example. There are three nodes, there are three edges, or something where you introduce an intermediate node. In fact, that's exactly what we do. We introduce an intermediate node, which is N1. We view from a graph theory viewpoint that C is connected to N1 when it's a multi, uh, uh, it's not a multi-point network. A is also connected to N1, and someone else could also be connected to N1, and it will be the same N1. And now in order to, in some sense, speak for N1, the two routers will agree who is the so-called designated router. So the designated router, this part is designated by the hello protocol. A says to C, I am on N1. C says to A, I am on N1, but I was before you, therefore I am designated. So whoever has the smallest ID uh, uh, will be the designated router. And here, uh, this will be visible in the form that C says it's connected to N1. And C will also speak for N1 by saying, I am N1, I am Ethernet, the cost is zero because I am a virtual node, and I am connected to routers A and C. So we'll see that the top, if we would like to draw the topology database from A, we'll say, I am connected to N1, and N1 is connected to A and C. Yeah. Now let's assume that F, that was present, but not yet booted, now boots. Then what will happen? Well, F might, will run the hello protocol on N1 and N7. That might happen in parallel or not, but the topology database must synchronize sequentially. So let's assume F speaks first to N1, then it will discover here by sending the hello protocol, see that there is somebody on N1. C will reply because C speaks for N1. C will reply to F saying, yes, I am N1, I am the designated protocol. And then F and C will merge that databases. Since F has an empty database, it means simply C will copy its database to F. So F, at the end of this first step, will have all the information that was given here. All this information now. Now with the change now that C, uh, that N1 has now A, C, and F, will be present in F. F will do a similar thing with E. E will, uh, they will do the hello protocol. They will exchange the database. Now, uh, perhaps that's the way E will learn about F will be present, or perhaps E has learned it before. So at the end of this step, uh, with only at most one change, the topology database will be the same in E and F. And from now on, F will uh, start sending any new information it has. It will send the information, for example. I am connected to N7 uh, with uh, uh, from N7. And N7 is designated router on N7 will be E. 
and designated router on N1 will be seen here. So this is, at the end, the textual representation of the thing I'm drawing here. And from a graph theoretic viewpoint, this is how we can view it. We see that the networks like N7 and N1 appear as nodes. So A is connected to N1, C is connected to N1, and F is connected to N1. And in principle, the cost of going from N1, which is a virtual node, to anything is put to zero to avoid uh, having a uh, uh, misunderstanding of what the cost I say in principle, it's possible with some options of SPF to modify this, but that's another story. So this is the topology database part of OSPF. At the end of the floating phase, the, and this floating phase is, I said at the end when the network boots, but this is happening continuously. The routers will, every uh, few seconds, send a new LSA, refreshing the LSA, so that uh, the information is always kept to the most recent value. And every router will use this to derive this graph here. So every router has a complete view of this graph, which is here small, but in, uh, in an OSPF network, there can be perhaps 100,000 prefixes here. So it may be a large graph. But here, we typically have a, low, a large number of stub networks and not such a large number of routers, because a network that has 100,000 prefixes probably does not have 100,000 routers. I don't know of a network that has 100,000 routers. So the, it requires machines that, are, that have uh, disks. So this is why OSPF was not uh, available or was not used very much in the 90s or 80s before, because at those times, disk and memory and processors were not uh, the way they are today. For today's uh, performance, uh, this is considered not a problem. But uh, this is also why we don't use it. For example, if we have very small devices, we might still continue to use RIP or source routing. I mentioned that OSPF packets are sent directly over IP. Uh, as, oh, I might have said UDP, that was wrong. They are sent directly over IP. So that's uh, a protocol type that we see in the, uh, in the IP header. Now, OSPF routers are identified by something that looks like an IPv4 address. It's a 32-bit number. But OSPF, the latest version, supports, of course, IPv6. And when supporting IPv6, it supports IPv6 and IPv4 and dual stack. When you do a routing protocol, there is an issue that you need to solve. I mean, do you want to have a routing protocol for IPv4 and another for IPv6? You can. But if you use the latest version of OSPF, you can also have one routing protocol that will manage the two. So you can have one instance of, IP, of OSPF that uses, for example, IPv6, but that can still have in its topology database all the information about IPv4. This is what we call dual stack network operation. So once we have collected the topology database, what OSPF routers do is, in the background, they continuously run Dijkstra. Not continuously, but whenever there is a change to the topology database, we rerun Dijkstra, which is an algorithm for computing shortest paths. And that's the goal at the end. So how is it done? Well, I said the goal at the end, but it's not true. I mean, the goal of a router is not to compute the shortest path to a destination. The goal of a router is compute what? Well, what does the router need? It needs to know the next hop for a destination. That's the only thing it needs. With RIP, that's the only thing it will compute. With OSPF, it will compute the next hop by computing the entire path. So it has a complete view. It will compute an entire path, and it will distill from the entire path only the next hop. That's the only information that will be put in the topology database. How does it compute the shortest path? Well, you are a router, uh, like uh, this one, for example. You need to compute the distances to all destinations. In these small networks, there's not so many. But in a typical network, there are, there's a large number of destinations. What you will compute is the shortest path 
from myself to all possible destinations. So we need an algorithm that's good at that, which is not solely the same as computing a shortest path from self to one destination. Or the converse problem, compute the shortest path uh, from to a certain destination from all routers, which is what Bellman for done. The arm that has the smallest complexity today is Dijkstra's open short, Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm. So typically, an OSPF router will run uh, Dijkstra's algorithm because that's the one that it has the less complexity. Voila, that's the end for today. Next week, we will see how we use Dijkstra's algorithm in uh, OSPF.